good evening, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Zoe Wilcox. I'm curator of the British Library's exhibition, Shakespeare in 10 Acts. And so I'd like to welcome you all to the British Library today. Um, on in our main gallery until the 6th of September, we have um, our main summer exhibition, which looks back at over 400 years of Shakespeare in performance. Um, looking at 10 productions that reveal how Shakespeare became the icon that he is today and how those plays have been reinvented through the ages by each generation. Um, so I do hope you'll be able to have a look at the exhibition at some point if you haven't already. And one of those acts, one of our 10 acts, looks at Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream, the revolutionary circus-inspired production from 1970 which moved the dream away from the illustrative world of fairies and forests into this symbolic white space where the cast evoked a very different kind of Midsummer's Night from the one that had gone before. And uh, Peter Brook and Francis Delatour and Ben Kingsley and Peter Holland will be talking about that production tonight at 6.30. Uh, and there are still a few tickets left if anyone doesn't have a ticket for tonight's um, talk and would like to stay on. But of course, Peter Brook's relationship with Shakespeare began much earlier than 1970, from the puppet version of Hamlet that he created as a child to the moment in 1946 when he became the youngest person to direct at the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre and was described by Barry Jackson, who appointed him as the youngest earthquake I've known. <laughs> Great compliment. Peter Brook's career is truly legendary. And his productions of Shakespeare have included Love's Labour's Lost, Romeo and Juliet, Titus Andronicus, all for the URSC, uh, his film of King Lear with Paul Schofield in 1971, and more recently than that, productions such as La Tempête from 1990 and Hamlet starring Adrian Lester from 2001, both performed uh, in Paris, of course. So throughout his career, Shakespeare has been integral to his experiments with theatrical form, and his writings on the subject have been greatly influential, from the 1968 classic The Empty Space to his writings on, uh, specifically on Shakespeare in The Quality of Mercy and Evoking Shakespeare. There's really no way that I can possibly do justice uh, to introducing Peter Brook, so I just wanted to say to him a very great thank you for coming all this way from Paris tonight, today, to be with us here, this afternoon. Um, and I should just say that uh, this event is also being um, supported by London International Festival of Theatre, LIFT, um, and the LIFT biennial celebration of um, theatre from around the world is now underway and runs on until the start of July, and there are productions all over London at the Barbican, Sadler's Wells, the Royal Court, and elsewhere, so do check out their, uh, their programme. So I will now uh, hand over to Peter for uh, this afternoon's lecture, uh, which Peter tells me um, the actual title of this lecture didn't arrive in time uh, to make it to print, but it is The Skyscraper, and I will leave Peter Brook to explain why. Thank you very much. Your sounds are better than words. <laughs> Thank you. So now the words, 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 we need them. There is no way around it. But they're never the end of something. They're a starting point. And every word that we call Shakespeare is just a starting point. This is not a lecture because I have the horror of being lectured to, and therefore of lecturing to other people. I'm trying to explore with you, and at the end we'll share impressions. What this word Shakespeare really contains 
and I'm only going to take dogmatically one firm stand because it's an absolute belief. The moment anyone says, and I've got to be careful not to give the impression in anything I say or quote, but when one says Shakespeare thought, Shakespeare said, we are really taking the greatest mystery, the greatest enigma of all time in literature, this vastness called Shakespeare, and we're trying to turn him into somebody who could be sitting here and could be telling us what we should think, feel about politics, about religion, about human beings on every level. And if we look more simply, we can see that there is no trace anywhere of Shakespeare's own point of view, except in a very special work of his, which is the sonnets, where, like in a diary, he did express on certain precise themes <coughs> related to love, mainly, his own personal experience. So in those ways, we do hear, for a moment, Shakespeare saying, I thought, I felt, I lived. But in all his plays, and every actor, every director knows this, and at their own cost and at our cost ignores it, that each character is a fully developed living human being. There are no characters in the total range of Shakespeare's plays where the author thought, oh, this is the bad guy. This is the monstrous woman. Here is a good person. No. Each one of these persons, at the moment when they speak, expresses themselves with the full range of a human being. And like all human beings, the range is sometimes limited. Sometimes these are poor human beings. Sometimes they're very complicated, and the complication is a richness which the theater is here to make us share, allow us to share. When we meet somebody in the street, if every one of us now just got up and looked at their neighbor and then talked for a moment, it's very small knowledge we could have of the other person, as you say, good evening, ah, where have you come from? But in the tiny space of time, the three hour traffic, the stage, it is possible for somebody who in everyday life it may take, any psychiatrist would tell you, 10 years, 15 years to begin to know that person. Here we can meet the different levels of the person in a very short time, sometimes almost immediately. That's what a soliloquy is about. In a soliloquy, there is a concentration of what is lived through by the person over days and days of feeling and thought, which leads to these words. And so that leads us straight to what I call the skyscraper. I use this word in the way that all metaphors, all similes, are a quick way of what otherwise could take a long, long, and eventually boring time to explain. But a simple image at once contains a lot of levels of meaning. And it is the same with every word that there is in this totality of works, these 35, 36 plays were considered in one volume the works of Shakespeare in the same way this can immediately be sensed if we take this simple <laughs> image of a skyscraper. What do we know about a skyscraper? Whatever it is, it has its root, it has even its basement, its cellars, 
sometimes flooded, sometimes right sinking into the earth, into the soil, for better and for worse. And from that, bit by bit, a construction has been made which leads in the end to what in all time, not only in Christianity, but in other religions, has been the church. But the church, as we know it, is this building, if we can say this is also the collected works of Shakespeare, but it has a steeple. And the steeple is a finger pointing upwards to the sky. In a skyscraper, we go to a great city of skyscrapers like New York, and we're very touched, particularly if there's a setting sun by the beauty of what we see. But in the same way as with a church, a cathedral, our eyes naturally rise to this infinity, which we so easily forget, particularly in bad weather. We, it's, in good weather, it's sometimes too hot, and sometimes we're too preoccupied just to pause as we walk along the street and remember that from our point of view, this is turbulent, rich, dangerous place that we live in, this marketplace of our world, is the whole world. And then we stop, we look up, and we see that this is an anthill in this something named the universe. And the reason that skyscraper means something is that it's a practical, available image to me. And at the same time, related to the works of Shakespeare, and that's what I hope that we can dwell on now in more and more detail, in the complete works of Shakespeare, one can see that there are this infinite number of levels. And that theme after theme, character after character, line after line, and in the end, word upon word, you can either rush past or one can feel that within it there are these shifting levels of meaning, some of which open you up just a few floors up, some pull you a few floors down, and sometimes they lead you to that moment of astonishment, that silence when, as we say, so easily, words fail. We'll start in looking at our skyscraper. We go into a skyscraper, we go into a lift, and it can take us very quickly, floor to floor, floor to floor, floor to floor, right up to the top, still within that same building. And then, and this goes for a single word, a single word. I was thinking today how easily one hears somebody talking about a party they've had and say, oh, it was divine. <laughs> I know that you can go into a shop and buy Zen face cream. <laughs> and the whole of our culture is based on a few words that go beyond, contain something more than their everyday meaning. Even sacred is rapidly desacralized, but they still retain that tiny intimation of something more. And so when we take the elevator we're still in the same building. We're still passing through these floors and floors until we get to the top floor. And on the top floor of the skyscraper, we can open a door and we can come out. And that come out is where suddenly all the, br the bricks and mortar, all the concrete, 
all the machinery, all of that vanished. We're out in the light and in the air. And if one comes back to what we're talking about today, the works of Shakespeare, one can see that there are that moment, and we can't make this a working method. It's, these are moments of grace, marvelous moments when having made big efforts, everyone directing a play, acting in a play, everyone studying a play, know that the efforts, the efforts it demands are like climbing in a high building, step after step, and feeling as if the rehearsal process, oof, we've got there. And then you realize, oh no, you're only on the eighth floor. It feels that you've got a long way. <laughs> God, we've got to start again. And the process, then when you start playing it, it's the same process. You go up and up and up. And there comes a point when you've made the last effort, you've got the top floor. And there you can push that door open. And suddenly there's no effort left. Nothing. You're out in what it's all about. And it's not just you're out, out in heaven. From there you have a view of the whole teeming world. And from the top you look down and you see all the busy human beings, the busyness of the marketplace. You know that that is as real as any other part of human activity. This is as we are. And even if you look carefully, you may see the police charging in and bashing people on the head today more than ever. But at the same time, it doesn't lose for you. It doesn't take away from your sense. Very simply, in Shakespeare, simple line, there is a world elsewhere. come back to this dreaded word because it's so dry and theoretical, the esoteric and the profane. These are dictionary words, and at once one hears, not from Shakespeare himself, but through a character that he brought to life, someone saying, hang up philosophy. There must be professional philosophers amongst you this afternoon. Forgive me if I remind you of that, but that's inseparable from those steps of words, 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 leading to definitions, leading to analysis of plays, footnotes, all of which are useful steps. But there comes a point when that's not eventually what it's all about. And this brings us back to this dreaded word, esoteric. Esoteric and profane. For me, we're examining them because they're ever present, play by play, line by line, in all of Shakespeare. There is this natural movement from the esoteric to the profane, something that is opened and then deliberately brought down into the soil of everyday life. But what does the esoteric really mean? I think that today we can see that religions as such, even what's called spirituality, have got themselves a bad name. They have, quite rightly, by abuses over so many centuries, got themselves a bad press. And religion, as so many massacres are in the name of religion, the blood spills onto the word, onto the different churches or faiths that this represents. They are splashed with the blood that they have brought into existence. Simple fact. But all through history, there have been these little, not secret, but little quiet brotherhoods and sisterhoods of people, 
sometimes finding the necessity to be together in monasteries or convents just to be able to give themselves in a purer way to what the call of their faith involves. And there, in monasteries and convents, they are sustained day after day by rituals. But at the same time, they are paying the price of not being part of the rough and tumble of the everyday life. Then this need to be in a small number of people closely working together to share that fine, unnameable something that goes right deeply to the heart. There, in every culture, people have come together and as what they're trying to find is so precious, it's not available in the marketplace. Unfortunately, we know that today again, that like the word divine, words that really belong to that esoteric tradition have been rapidly embraced from yoga, tai chi. These are all forms great Japanese, Chinese martial arts, all of which have been developed in very special conditions and are now on the marketplace. Even there was a time when with our actors we were studying Tai Chi, which was coming into Europe through one person for the very first time, it's about 50 years ago, and one learned that this was something based, above all, on silence. Breathing, silence, certain movements. And what was so touching in it was that this was all, in its very nature, very light and effortlessly slow. A year after we'd begun to study this, a man came to see me who'd come from Oh, somewhere in the Midlands. And he said, I've started a school. I think that with no time for this Chinese method of Tai Chi, but there's something in it, and so I've started a school for quick Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how <laughs> the skyscraper, the lift begins to go right down to the basement. <laughs> But in the very same way, with, again, it's shared by the, the current of rivaling religions, we here all have to recognize, although hardly anybody mentions it in today, we are in a culture that created the Inquisition. I've just come from Spain. They are very horrified what's going on, but nobody mentioned to me Seville in the Inquisition as an expression at the time of pure Christian faith. At the same time, in Islam, to protect its essential purity, Sufism developed. Sufism as something which behind that single word contained all sorts of things that could only be shared by those day after day and even hour after hour practicing <coughs> developing the need to understand more deeply certain indications that the prophet had left. And in Sufism there is a something as striking dramatically as the Inquisition, there was a man called Halaj, who after long, long years, deep, deep inner searching, suddenly 
went up to that point in his inner skyscraper when he, having climbed all those steps, emerged and saw really what was all around him and said, I am the truth. There was no vanity in that. He didn't mean that he was that. He meant that he was opened up to a whole universe of something that we've never, ever, thank God, been able to capture and explain the truth. And having said that, he was burnt at the stake, just as we have done in Seville. Halaj was burnt. I say this now to come back to the middle ground, because that's where we are really with Shakespeare. There is that top, there is that bottom, but in the middle is that series of flaws, and it's a great number of flaws, but they are just in the middle. They're still within the walls of the building. There is still an intimation that there are more and more flaws above. There's a sense that we started from ground level. And having started from ground level, we've come here to the middle, but we haven't <coughs> forgotten the fact that when we go home, when we come down, we are literally coming down to earth. And this to me is perhaps the most striking thing in the whole of Shakespeare's work. In all his plays, Shakespeare brings us, or rather I won't say Shakespeare brings us, through his themes, through the stories that he felt were exciting to develop, through his characters, we are raised to a point where, for a moment, I say, we recognize that we're together with an audience, and that every audience knows that. There are moments in a play when you feel that we're all touched at the same moment. We've come in as a hundred so different heads, different preoccupations. It's quite right. We've come off the street, and the street is that busy state of chaos of the world. And now, together, in a short space of time, we're working together with a little group of actors on a play, on a theme, on human relations. We're brought to a moment that, and we're not in danger, I think, of being burnt for this, for a moment that, together, we all sense this is a moment of truth, something in a human relation, something between two young lovers, something between Hamlet in front of his own questioning and predicament. In so many different ways, we all feel at this moment what is being expressed is human, and what human means is that it's like us all. And what it means being like it all is that at this moment, people that we don't know who they are sitting next to us no longer matters. We are what's called an audience, and an audience is a word in the singular. We have become one body, one body for a moment. And that always expresses itself in a moment, even a fleeting moment of silence. You can feel that. People are laughing, chattering, going along with it, thinking of it as they go. And then there's a moment when there's a whirling of the different heads, which makes a noise that one can't hear, but which is always there, suddenly stops. And the only word that we know that really corresponds to that is we are touched. And every actor. Every performer knows that 
they and the audience become one because everyone is touched by a moment of truth. And at that moment, everything stops and there is. I see, even for the shortest, shortest moment, in that moment of suspension, a silence, not an inert silence, not a graveyard silence, not a silence of old bones, but a silence that is full of life itself. And Shakespeare brings us to it. His plays, his people bring us to this point. But Shakespeare himself, as the dramatist, we know nothing of what he was after, how he worked, but we do know that at the moment when, in writing the plays, and there's every reason to believe that he wrote this large number of plays very fast, at the moment of writing, had reached in himself, through his characters, that moment where something beyond what one could have expected is suddenly alive. He feels that it would be pretentious, phony, alien to a life experience to remain there devotedly on our knees in a monastery. No, at that moment, he feels the absolute need to make us all feel, once again, that we're all part of the human race, all part of humanity, by bringing us down to earth without hesitation, with the crudest sexual jokes. All through the plays, one sees that natural intermingling. There's not a play where the highest moments, when we've hung up philosophy and we've gone beyond it, to there are not linked to something of real, crude, tavern humor. And whether it's Mistress Oberdan, Oberdan by the last, or whether it's the bawdy, because the word bawdy at once brings, if you hear the word bawdy, then you're no longer the peak of the skyscraper. And the bawdy hand, yes, but the bawdy hand is on what? He could have just as easily, or rather the character in the play could easily have said, it's midday, not at all. He says, and it's such a relief for everyone to have that natural laugh. The bawdy hand of the clock is on the prick of noon. <laughs> and that natural, natural humor brings everything down to the same level as characters like Dolter, Sheep, Mistress Oberdan. They're all there to share in this task as all the jokers, <coughs> the jesters, as the fool has to balance King Lear. King Lear would never have the same resonance if along this extraordinarily powerful, multi, multi-dimensional figure, this skyscraper with so many floors and levels, King Lear, wasn't balanced by something as rich, a tiny skyscraper with a many levels, but a child skyscraper down there, which is the fool and the two interlinking make it possible for us to enter into a world beyond anything that we are capable of imagining, Leah's own tremendous journey. And yet, we're there with the fool, with his wink and his nudges and his jokes, and the two levels once again come together. And that is where this middle area of Shakespeare's work is so important as long as one sees and welcomes all that is of the marketplace, 
all because of crude, low humor, which in Victorian times was no doubt vulgarized or even completely let out of the play as not being worthy of our great national hero. And today, one sees that it's almost in danger of going to the other extreme. There is such a fear of, rightly, of anything too grand, too pretentious, and above all, of anything that you could remotely call esoteric or spiritual, my God, no, and particularly in England. <laughs> Although England, if you look at this tradition, is the most mystical of all traditions, but it's carefully, carefully concealed and always covered with humor, almost always. But right at the bottom, you have this everyday level, and that in Shakespeare, the speed with which he goes from one to the other is sometimes breathtaking. I remember Ted Hughes telling me that he was very interested, at the great poet he was, by finding the way in Shakespeare's play the word and as a very special place. Because for him, Shakespeare, in Shakespeare, you hear a word that for a large bulk of the audience might seem a bit learned, a bit something that the nobles and the intellectuals on the stage would nod and say, mm, that's well said. But for the rest of the audience, for the common people, the thieves, the pickpockets, the whores, and all the other people mixed together in the audience, you'd say, what was that word? And how often in one sentence you have an and which links the top to the bottom so that everyone can, with the same meaning, same surface meaning, so everybody comes together without that feeling of, oh. But to go back to what I was saying a moment ago, what I was beginning to think was that today, which is for obvious natural cycles of human history, having reached something which unfortunately was appropriated by one middle class in all the so-called developed countries, all the countries that considered themselves educated and civilized, because there was such an appropriation of the arts and so much value given to something being of good taste, of being beautiful. I was brought up with this feeling that the real, the middle class sense that you go to a concert, you go to an exhibition, because you're part of those who can appreciate beauty. And then came, in the middle of the 19th century, this revolt against this, a whole new movement which said, yeah, but something that would have been so obvious in Shakespeare's day, you are losing touch with the soil, with the basement, and so, from Look Back in Anger and John Osborne onwards, there was this rediscovery of the rough, of the value of earth and soil and roughness. And actors who were told that they could never make a career at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre unless they learnt good kings and queens English and speak as gentlemen should speak the words of our great national dramatist, and suddenly there were actors who said to hell with it. I'm going to play a prince with a North Country accent. Albert Finney was one of the first to do this, and these were major revolutionary steps, and it brought the basement, 
the street level of the skyscraper back into the middle where the plays were being done. But this very easily becomes an exaggeration. And today, one sees that making the plays of Shakespeare contemporary, which is what they have to be, plays only exist in the present. That's why one talks about presenting a play. A play is a presentation. It has no meaning at all if it's a recorded lecture that can't touch us today. No, a play is a, re, a renaissance. The plays written long ago suddenly are about us today. That's what matters. And we've all had the experience of seeing plays of Shakespeare where we are no longer thinking in old-fashioned terms of do these costumes, do these gestures, does that music, does that have the right period ring? No, just the quality of our experience at this moment. And this is a two-edged sword because either that can be the very stimulus to try to be a, a few floors higher up in the skyscraper without losing the sense that we are still rooted in the soil. Or it can be the opposite, saying, oh, let's now go to lower floors and making something contemporary is this crude but so easy trap of bringing in television jokes, television gags, bringing in nods to current events in a crude way, which for a moment can be marvelous, but if the expense of it is to suddenly make us forget that there are higher floors, then we are dragging the plays and the characters within them from the skyscraper where that quality should be always present, rising and falling in every character, in every situation, in every line, in every word. No. We're brought down by somebody. And suddenly discovering that if I say to be or not to be, yes, that's the question. <laughs> you see how easy it is to get a laugh. <laughs> but it is, I mean, it is a knife edge, and it's very difficult for all of us, directors, actors, writers, always to keep in mind this endless balance that we have to find, because it is there, and we are talking about Shakespeare, the works of Shakespeare in every one of these works, these are all omnipresent at every time, and I'd say in my own personal, private working vocabulary, the most useful word is sharing some work with others or with myself is detail. That whatever detail there is, and by mean detail in the flow of time, one says a line, we say the line which contains the whole of skyscraper, and like all Shakespeare, these are lines of such simplicity that they can be understood all over the world, which is to be or not to be. We've used this so often with actors as a working exercise just to see that with those few words, to be or not to be, and sometimes that is the question. There is no limit to the different ways that that can be said. Not if one's looking self-consciously of how can I change the music. I remember the director saying like this, change the tune, boy. No, just to feel that there is more detail than in the words to be 
to be as a simple everyday word, but one can feel the, something within that simple word to be. There is a detail, and by that detail, colours or not to be. And the word question takes on new detail if the first line to be or not to be bring us to the point when it's clear that there is something in suspension, something that can't be understood. And then this coming down to this, that's the question. Or the exact opposite, to be or not to be, and then realizing we've said something where we've rushed past the detail and that that the question is on the contrary an opening to something more. And as I speak, it at once brings to mind the, because in this soliloquy one sees that every time it's spoken we're with an actor taking us on a completely new journey if the actor is really at that moment not playing ideas or thoughts but the living interrogation not of himself nor of Shakespeare but of that character that unknown character called Hamlet and one can see how gradually, gradually, this is leading us to something which stops us in our tracks when he begins to say, thinking too precisely on the event, too pre thinking precisely at once links us to hang up philosophy, stop explaining, stop defining. That very act of trying to understand just with one's rational powers, with all that Descartes brought into European consciousness, that can go just so far, but there's a limit. And at that point, something that takes us through, again, the whole works of Shakespeare, which is, and lose the name of action. And action takes us right to a whole level of esoteric meaning, because it's there. What is the relation between thought and action? We have to act. We're here on this earth to act. We're not here just to sit, shut away as hermits. And action it's a very, goes a very, very long way, that detail in Hamlet's overall exploration, because it takes us right into so many great traditions. It takes us in Hinduism to the heart of the Bhagavad Gita, when before the great battle, Arjuna sees that he is being asked to take part in a massacre, and he sees in front of him half of his family, his uncles, his cousins, and he is being asked to launch a war that he knows will massacre the people closest to him in his family. And naturally, as a human being, he stops. And this is just like Hamlet. At that moment, the god Krishna has to try to lead him step by step through so many complex meanders which directly relate to the same process in a different form in Hamlet, to a point where he realizes that he cannot abandon action. And in the case of Hamlet, we're right in the heart of an available, unpretentious, simple, but challenging, esoteric thinking. 
here in Hamlet, he is asked to revenge his father without soiling his mind. Here's a question that we can carry away with us today, and if we come back to it, we can never escape it for the rest of our lives. How, if only all our generals and leaders and people inciting rebellion, mutiny, fighting, struggle, could ask themselves, is it possible to go into what is understood to be a rightful revenge? The father has asked him for revenge. He can't fail to do his duty to his father, who has been unjustly murdered. He can't fail in that. And yet he is told by his loving father, do it without soiling your mind. So this is a question they say we can't get away from. What does that contain? We would long for our leaders occasionally to ask themselves that question. But it's, only, it's easy to be a politician because your mind is soiled already. <laughs> <coughs> but it's not for nothing that we come back to Hamlet. It's not for nothing that we come back to Lear. In Lear, I've often quoted because to me it was so memorable how when Paul Schofield, who's in the greatest of the many actors I've known, but a great in a very special way, Paul Schofield never soiled his mind with theory and philosophy. Each time I started a discussion with him, he'd stop me and say, no, no, I have to play this. And his way of acting a part was very simple. He was in his 40s, he was playing King Lear, and he was just like the person reaching the top of the skyscraper, just opening the door. And as he opened the door, after preparing in the way he did, everything fell away and he just was the character. Man in his 40s, one can see it in the film, still a thing. He is, he's not impersonating. He's not in actor's terms characterizing an old man. He hasn't studied how does an old man walk. What does he do now? He really becomes, which is the aim of all that. And the moment he becomes, very special, particular, complex, powerful, but very old man. He doesn't have to show it in the feeble way that many actors try to by showing that he's in his dotage. No, he just becomes a unique person. King Lear, who is in full possession of everything with one terror of going mad, of losing his brain, and at the same time, the actor playing it is no longer a puppeteer controlling the act, acting. No, he is King Lear. And so when, it's something I've often quoted, forgive me, but for me it's the supreme detail of great acting. Every single performance, he would say the simplest, even simpler than to be or not to be, after Cordelia's death, never, 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 never. I'm trying to be neutral, not to try to imitate an actor, because every single time in the hundreds of performances we did in so many different parts of the world, different circumstances, that the rhythm of those five was never the same because the whole of what he as a character had been experiencing 
at that very moment was what gave the detail to the vibration which went into the voice of those particular words. And so suddenly you see an, the most ordinary word there is, never, contains a skyscraper of levels. And each one, then it becomes like a skyline of New York because each one of those skyscrapers is a different one, never. And there, that's the value of seeing something that you know can't be imitated, but it is for all of us a permanent call to try to work in that direction. And for me, but there is n no indication anywhere that Shakespeare was trying to teach us anything at all. But he couldn't help all of his own experience coloring his, under, his understanding of a character who, like Paul Schofield's playing of a character, suddenly the character becomes so that He's the opposite of a dear friend and much admired Sam Beckett, who would spend a year dwelling on each phrase and trying to prove it, deep humility, saying, yes, but why? Why have I written that? What am I trying to say? Why is this man looking out of the window? Why isn't he sitting? And with that, marvelous reflection, he at the same time, by thinking so precisely, brought himself to a point when he could never go beyond it, as only one person in history has done, which is Shakespeare. And there's only one thing I feel is unique about Shakespeare, and that is that he's unique. Just that. He has a name. He has this wonderful exhibition that the library has made where you see so many different aspects and you see his signature and you see his head and you see how the people have understood him. But the unknown dominates it all because all that we do know is that he had an incredible capacity to look and to listen, and that perhaps uniquely in all writing, his capacity to be anywhere in the street, above all in a power, but in the taverns where really so much of the life went on, and in the theater and talking with the actors and at home and in the country, all of that Second for second, all the impressions were being absorbed. And it's sufficient to recognize that while you and I can go and meet interesting people, we can go on an adventure holiday, have marvelous impressions. But yes, there today there are selfies and there are photographs <laughs> and we can show our friends. But what we retain it's a tiny number, but if one sees this exceptional case that I've written about quite recently, that in neurological cases we do come across this phenomenon of memory. Somebody who can pick up what was the old London phone book and in reading through, retain names, addresses, and phone numbers. I mean, this is something that, again, the mind boggles. But it is possible for a human being. And if you have this one unique human being with a unique capacity to hear, watch, listen, and retain, there is no reason at all to say 
which is so snobbish and so repellent, how could this peasant from the country know all that we people from the court, we people of learning, we people from the university have spent so much time learning that it was enough for Shakespeare to be in a tavern and with a couple of soldiers back from some war laughing and drunkenly exchanging memories. And the next table he hears somebody telling news of court. And at another table, somebody talking about how hard it is to reconcile what you felt as a Catholic and what you're supposed to feel as a Protestant. He's absorbing all this. But all this was not virgin territory because from the day he was born in the country, he was absorbing and that love of nature, the love of nature, of the forest, of the plants, all of that which we see again in so many plays, all the qualities that were there in The Tempest, all of those are things that very young, he was there in nature, before saying much later, the theater is holding a mirror up to nature where you have the two natures, the nature of the plants, of the heavens that are there in some of the plays, and at the same time of this, the human nature, the two come together. But one can see that for all of those who say, poor country yokel, what did this peasant, lower class man know about higher things? There was a boy absorbing, and today one said need to go to the country around Stratford, and even today one can get the most wonderful impressions of the beauty of the earth, of the plants, of the flowers, the trees, the hills, and it's quite obvious that somebody is so sensitive, this inborn poetic soul is receiving and none of those are lost. That is the extraordinary thing about the human mind. We have the impression that everything is forgotten, but deep, deep down, and hypnotism can sometimes bring a bit up to the surface, everything, every impression, second by second, is retained somewhere. And given, again, this strange unknown quality of what we call genius, in the way that a musical genius, this whole universe of sounds comes in without them even calling, just because it's needed. They are just because a character in Shakespeare is beginning to speak about something, and suddenly you have a speech about order, Ulysses speaking about order, and you recognize that there is the whole of nature and the whole of human nature all live within an unknown structure of order and that potentially, not in the chaotic, chaotic way of everyday life, but potentially there is always an order not recognized, sometimes recognized, sometimes distorted into a hierarchy out of which tyranny comes, but coming back to Shakespeare, nature, and nature leads us straight to Prospero. Prospero, recognizing that within nature, before you get into the world of the cities and the courts, there is something that one can call, and it, again, it's a word that has so many levels, like esoteric, but there is magic. And that magic is what, in the tempest, is violently used, both by Prosper himself and eventually by the others who want to murder him, is used ruthlessly 
for power and Prospero's wish for revenge has tainted his mind and he is hell-bent, literally hell-bent on revenge until he, the deepest, deepest qualities emerge and makes him recognize what is beyond revenge and He breaks his wand, he drowns his books, he gives it all up to return to being a simple human being. And at the very end of the play, he prays for a prayer, and it's an uncanny, but this is, again isn't Shakespeare, it's Shakespeare through Prospero speaking of a prayer that pierces mercy itself a sense of a prayer that is not the way we think of a prayer, but so sharp, such clarity, that it's like a needle or a blade. And that leads us to what maybe, and many people really believe is the last word Shakespeare wrote, which is free. And that freeing all these aspects of the human outer nature, inner nature, that are clouding completely, clouding us from a sense of what true natural order could be. And that prayer for freedom, but not the freedom of tyrants, not the freedom of but again, a word that is a skyscraper of meanings. Freedom. Free. And as far as we know, that could be the last word that Shakespeare wrote. And that can resonate in us. And that, in a way, brings together all the different levels of this unique something called the complete works of Shakespeare, works that contain all the esoteric teaching in the world, but not through a teacher preaching or teaching, but there at every moment to be discovered and rediscovered, not just by sitting at home and reading it, because there again one is betraying the real function of writing for performance, but finding that we can rediscover this every time the words and the characters are brought to life for us and with us in performance. And at that moment, the structure with all its levels can for a moment begin to come into being. And then of course, we're back at the starting point. And hearing myself say starting point, I think it's a good place to end. <laughs>
Q and A. <laughs> so there may be Q, but there's certainly no A. I'm not here. I'm not here to be an A, but we can share impressions where we open things up together. You give your impressions, you challenge, you accuse. <laughs> the field is open. Thank you. Th sorry. Thank you so very, very much. Um, you said that plays can only exist in the present. Tonight I'm going to go and stand at the Globe Theatre um, where they're going to try and recreate what it was like in Shakespeare's time. Is, 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 is that pointless or possible? Or I think that what is marvellous in the Globe experiment is to see that the original Globe the Globe Theatre really did, was the most democratic of all forms, and because it did contain a possibility for every level of society all to come together, and so the plays and the people are all there. The opposite of the Italian tradition of the beautiful, beautiful opera houses in, in which gradually there were the young, enthusiastic people with least money stuck away up there, and the people with the most, in the best seats, so-called, closest the actors, which is a terrible thing because the actor looking down sees fat, sleeping bodies in front of him. <laughs> and I mean, we've tried very hard, whenever one can, to change that and have cheapest seats, even cushions close to the actor, so that there is that relation. And so the globe, and of course, in the globe, they're all the time searching, and that's in their own very active way to see how you can keep that life without it becoming a museum. So I hope you'll have a good evening. Oh. I can't comment, so I haven't seen it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, I'll, I'll ask for an impression rather than ask a question, um, because it's a sort of unfair question. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, interested Good, go <laughs> I'm interested in your thoughts, your impressions about um, verse speaking today, theatre being a living thing and that we have to speak it for today, what are your thoughts on actors approaching this language that's structured in verse? Well, I don't want always to sound against scholars because it's very important. But again, there is this danger level where philosophy, thinking too precisely, can be a barrier. And there was, oh, last century, a big movement coming out of the universities of analyzing the structure of verse. And actors of that school would learn how many, to see how many beats there are in a line, and where there was what's called an end stop, and where there's a break, and would learn this like first level music students. But all of that is only meaning, as it is with music, if you then assimilate it, it's a good starting point, it's ground floor, and then you can free yourself of it. But there have been lots and lots of schools, and Stratford was no exception, where actors were taught to speak according to the rules. And that is the opposite of what I was just trying to say with Schofield, where, of course, the sense of these rhythms were there, but they were never illustrated. They were never the rules. They were just a starting point. Perhaps he knew the rules of verse and dynamic and all that oh, when he was 18. But by the time he was 20, he was going beyond it. 
And I think that is where we must be very, very careful to say that the rules are good supports, like I had to hand, have the handrail and the steps to come up from a platform, and now, thank God, I'm no longer <laughs> clinging on to it. It is that, it's really a double-edged sword, the analysis of verse speaking. I see this much more strongly because in English, whatever the sentence is, that was just illustrating with to be or not to be, there are a million variations on that music. It is free jazz on top of the beat, while in the French Comédie Française Alexandrine tradition, it's never a word, but a line or even three, four lines with their rhymes considers as a whole. And you have to really learn to s respect that, bring out the rhyme, bring out the beat, <coughs> bring out that. And that, of course, creates corsets around the actor. Our, our mutual acquaintance, Cicely Berry, talks about feeling the beat in your bones <coughs> ah. as opposed to the rules. Yes. Now you've said it all. Feeling the beat in your bones. So Spivy has been a very great person in the whole life of Shakespeare and other actors. And it's been her birthday very recently, I think. She and I celebrated our birthdays together, actually, in Stratford just a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I thought it was very recent. <laughs> Hello. Um, it's only a small detail in everything that you've said but the words that you used rightful revenge um, concerning Hamlet's predicament, whether or not he were able to do that without soiling his mind, those words rightful revenge stick in me. <laughs> so I, I, it's obviously just an, another enormous question, but... Um, something in me couldn't let it go by. Thank you, you're absolutely right. This rightful is the wrong word. There is a, no, what is rightful is to respect deeply the father's demand and then to find your way all the way through it. And I mean, and, and there it comes to what I quoted with Arjuna and the abbot. You can say, I will abandon that action, which is a pacifist way out, or you will say, I will assume it. And nobody can say what is righteous. One can only ask oneself, is this righteous? And what does that mean? So you've raised an enormous question. Uh, sorry, I used so easily the word. Um, may I ask from here? Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, I want to make an observation that while you were speaking, um, you were facing that way to your left, and the people on that side facing you responded with laughter. Mm -hmm. We on this side, were silent. Now, that must be because they were relating to you and we were not. And I wonder if that happens in the course of a live performance on stage in a play. <laughs> First of all, let me apologize to all of you. <laughs> But what is interesting, in the play we're doing at the moment, which is uh, the battlefield, battlefield, only recently I was saying to one of the actors, watch out, 
you're continually playing more to this side <laughs> than to that. And you must find a way, quite naturally, of talking as though you don't look like in a film. And this was an actress, in fact, who's done a lot of filming. And in the film, the camera can move, so you look straight into the eyes of the person, even from a long, long scene. You don't have to turn your head, because for the audience, the camera will do it. But I explained to her, I said, look, in the theater, everyone, that is, we often do exercises on that, but it is very difficult not to lose sight that if you're really sincerely, sincerely involved in a person who happens to be there, not to lose touch with the people who are there and here. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm from Iran, and uh, from where? Nine, yes, Iran. Oh. <laughs> in 1976, I came here because of two men. Both of them were English: William Shakespeare and Tony Benn. I came because of these two. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, Tony Benn was minister of. Uh, what have they in common? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> You've really I'm, got an audience longing to hear. <laughs> So the only thing, um, I, uh, since I was there in Iran, and, and, and I'm actually an actor, uh, I started to learn acting there in Iran. I was always very, very cross with people that were trying to say Shakespeare didn't write his books. I think the best proof for this are people like you, Peter Brook, like Paul Schofield, like uh, John Shapiro, who wrote that beautiful book, 1599 and Ben Kingsley, and all the people like that uh, proves that Shakespeare existed. That I wanted to say this. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear you mention James Shapiro, because he is already the great, great, great Shakespearean. And I spoke to him just very recently about the themes of this esoteric and profane, and he drew my attention to the fact that there is one very, very great example of that, and that is in the poem, The Phoenix and the Turtle, where the theme of death and resurrection, very deeply esoteric theme, and how this relates to something which, curiously enough, takes us straight to King Lear, because in King Lear, one can see this sense of the meaning of, of numbers and proportion. King Lear, with his enormous experience of ruling and of people, saw right away that if you make a division into two, that's what the word division means, a division into two is bound to lead to conflict. But if there was that third, which was what he so hoped Cordelia could bring, then future strife could be avoided now. And it's the same thing in the Phoenix, the Turtle, where in the end that unity is produced by the two being brought into one. And so that does touch on the great, great theme. And that James Shapiro, for whom I've got great affection and admiration, raised that particular point in quoting to me the phoenix. Uh, hi there. Um, I wanted to ask, something of a motif throughout your talk has been um, what the man in the front said, feeling it in your bones. Uh, the masters of their craft feel it in their bones. Uh, so Shakespeare, Schofield. Um, you seem to be suggesting that study uh, is not something that can really take us to feeling it in our bones. Um, and I was just wondering what you feel the merits of study are, if there are any at all, and whether we can actually find that, I suppose, transcendent place that the masters of their craft do. Um, through study at all. 
The next week, this is a very important, it's the last question. I'm glad because it's a very deep question. In the same way that we've been talking, and I say an image is just an image, and a skyscraper, once we're finished with it, we can throw it out of the window. Poof. But what we've been talking about, the skyscraper makes us recognize these infinite number of intertwining levels and that you can't jump from one level to the other or fall out of the window and come in. You have to rise, rise, and sink, and there's always a lot of effort. Now, the same image, we can turn on its side and say the human being, well, in exactly the same structure of levels, there is the skin, and that's the shape that we all recognize, looking at another person and look at ourselves, the photograph of ourselves, and that's the outer level, which can be very beautiful, can be very convincing. Within it, there is, before you get actually in the flesh, the blood cells and the circulation, there are many, many levels that every dermatologist can recognize. And then behind that, there is the whole irrigation of the body for the blood, and then you come to the bones, and even a bone contains different qualities within it, so that if one sees that in that same way, every work of study, it's just like a medical student or a surgeon. You can't start by taking out your knife and go making a cut. You have to have studied and learned and recognized how vulnerable this human being is and how easily your knife can slip. But that doesn't take away from what you're asking. On the contrary, the deep value of every form of study and exploration from the outside more deeply to the inside, as long as one never for a moment believes that the levels have finished and now one's got to the core. And like a fruit, see, you can get to the core of a fruit. To get to a core of a human being, there's no end. Thank you very much. <laughs>